turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This is your host, Mark Metry, and today I'm joined by Wayne Shoss. Wayne, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a real treat. So, Wayne, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Um, I spend my time on planet Earth um, living out my passion, apart from being a husband and father of three kids, uh, normalising mental health, educating the broader community here in Australia about the value of these conversations. And you know, my purpose here on Earth is to really have a positive impact on other people's lives so that they can begin to prioritise their mental health because it's an issue that many are grappling with and it's having a dramatic impact on people's lives, families and communities. That's an excellent answer, man. So, wait, I want to ask you, how did you get down this, uh, this path of, of caring about mental health and um, starting your, uh, your, your different organizations that you have? How did, how did you get down this road? Yeah, it's a really good because the, the, I guess my own life has been preparing me and, and planning and getting me ready to do the work that I now do because uh, I have a lived experience with mental health conditions myself. I guess I've been on a mental health journey for 24 years um, and I was a professional athlete um, for 14 and a half years and for 10 of those mental health conditions, but I, I hid them. So my own experience um, has been a significant contributing factor, um, but I, have a, I just have a desire to try and use that experience um, and having a media career here in Australia to use that as the vehicle to begin to create conversations and amplify the need to have these valuable conversations for the broader community. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree. So, um, so what I, I want to ask you, I want to go into this a little bit. So like, uh, in your past, um, you know, when you were going through this, when did it, when did you start coming to, when did you start becoming aware of this? And when did you realize that I had to, I had to change? Um, again, that's a really good question. I, 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 when I look back, I was diagnosed with depression on the 9th of August, 1993 at the age of 23. But I guess when I look back on my life, there was probably four or five years before that, where with the benefit of maturity and having an understanding of what was actually going on as I've got older, it was probably a period of four or five years where things were happening, but I didn't have the emotional intelligence to understand or identify what was wrong. Mm. So diagnosed in 1993, and it wasn't until six years later that I realised that I was in the same place and I'd done nothing about it. So I... um, made a decision six years after I was diagnosed that I needed to get some help. And I spent four and a half years working with an amazing lady psychiatrist, learning the necessary skills and learning, and um, beginning to reclaim my life. But in saying all of that, I spent 12 years after being diagnosed hiding it from everybody bar four people. And um, I don't want people to make those same choices because I don't believe they have to. And I made those choices because of fear of what people would think, what people would say, and how would people behave if they found out that I had mental health conditions because there is there's a significant amount of shame and guilt that comes with these type of conditions and, and that's I think that's preventative. It, it, preventative in the sense that it stops people from getting help. So, you know, I'm comfortable with my life and I've learned to come to terms with it. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, mental health conditions have been a big part of my life, but... 
I'm not, I'm not embarrassed. I don't have any guilt. I don't carry that shame that I used to. And I don't want other people to do that, whether they're living in Australia or they're anywhere else around the globe, including America. Being, you know, a professional athlete, how, you know, how did you, how did you feel that that was maybe affecting your situation? The, the fame, maybe the, the pressure, the performance, how, how did that come into play, if at all? Yeah, no, no, it definitely came into play because you're playing. Your 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 profession is a very public career. It's, um, you know, it's it, with all due respect to the other sports here in Australia, it's probably the most AFL is probably the most popular sport in the country. Um, it certainly was when I played. Uh, there was a significant media industry that was covering the game. Um, I, I, I really struggled. I didn't like the attention that came with playing AFL football because I, the, you know, I spent everything I could to hide the fact that I had mental health conditions and it, it's almost a ironic situation that you're dealing with something very private, that you're investing so much time trying to make sure that there's no disclosure because if people were to find out, then I was convinced I'd lose the things that were most important to my career. Um, so I'm trying to suppress all of that and hide it all, while at the same time I'm getting judged and criticised for performances. So to give people some context, I, I, I played 282 games of AFL football, but 184 of those games were um, played with uh, depression, anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. So I never missed a training session, nor did I miss a game, and I achieved a lot of team and individual success. Um, but I, you know, with the benefit of maturity and, and, and you know, getting older, um, I had a good career. Could I have had a better career? Possibly because I invested so much of my time and effort into hiding my conditions. And when you do that, you're not investing all of your effort and energy into your career. You know, going, going through that, Wayne, in, in making the decision um, that you did to kind of change, what do you think is mostly stopping people people like your, in your situation from, from doing that thing? Mm. Yeah, I think on behalf of other people, Mark, but, you know, I've been the four years. So I've been a mental health advocate here in Australia for four of space on and off for 14 years. I now have a new business in this space all over Australia around this issue. And I think, I think there's two things that are significant reasons why people don't come forward and ask for help. One is, and that is almost a paralysing feeling that the fear of what people will say, how will they behave, what will they do if they find out. So that is one contributing factor. And I think the other one is this stigma, but I don't think stigma goes far enough. It's not strong enough. It's really... And that is that people living with mental health conditions are judged, they're criticised and they're labelled because they have mental health conditions. They are two significant, genuine reasons why I think people don't ask for help, why they don't speak up, why they don't step forward. And I genuinely believe that that's dangerous because, A, it stops people from getting the help that they need, or, B, it's a potentially contributing factor as to why so many people decide to end their lives. And, you know, a basic fundamental right of any human being anywhere around the world is, um, is the best available treatment without fear or failure. And that needs to change, and it needs to change quickly because here in Australia we lose, on average, seven people a day to suicide. It, you know, if you were to talk to yourself um, in that in that moment, so to speak, um, or somebody like that in a similar situation, what would you give them for uh, advice? What would you tell them to do or to think about? It's all the time, Mark, with people that come up and ask me for advice or contact me, um, and that is you have to take responsibility for your own health. Your support network's really important, but your health is your responsibility accept the fact that you need help, make a significant decision for your future, and that is to accept that you need professional help. Do everything you can to get that professional help and then invest everything that you have into your recovery and healing. Don't waste six years like I did. Don't waste six days, six minutes, six seconds. 
prioritizing your mental health is really important. And, and the other thing that I say to people all the time, Mark, is why wait until we get sick? We don't need to. We invest time, money and effort into our physical health because no one wants to be physically unwell. So it makes perfect sense that we, be, we should be doing the same thing for our emotional health. But here in Australia, um, and, and I ask a series of questions, I ask people if they're investing time, effort, money into their physical health, everybody puts their hand up. Over, the overriding reason why everybody wants to live as long as they possibly can, yet when I ask who's investing the same amount into their emotional health, I'm lucky if I get 10% of the audiences that I speak to put the disconnection between physical health health and belief that we both emotionally and physically better and we prevent sickness. So if we've got the opportunity to prevent sickness by investing into our emotional health and physical health, why wouldn't we do that? Yet the vast majority of people aren't doing that. And that's not to be critical. It just is what it is. So part of my mission and my organisation's mission is to help people make that connection and then, importantly, them develop a tool to prioritize their mental health. Hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, just in regards to the stigma, you know, things, things have definitely changed. Like when I was growing up, I, I never really heard the words anxiety or uh, depression. And, uh, you know, that it, it just wasn't even a thing. And I don't even think people have really given it that importance really up till maybe now. And, um, you know, we have more access to information. We're really seeing the the effects. We're seeing, um, you know, different things going on in the world. And I think it's made us question a lot of things on herself and maybe, you know, step by step, uh, help break this stigma. But, you know, what do you think it, it it's it's needed for, for our for the societies around the world to really start prioritizing this and to kind of break the the, the stigma, so to speak. Yeah, I, I'll I would begin answering that question by saying this: the issue of suicide, Australia. This is a global issue, and we're losing far too many people every single day all around the world to the issue of suicide. So it's a real problem for every country on the globe have a, a global ability to begin to create the people living to unashamedly begin to take care of their, their, their mental health. That means asking for help. That means talking openly. That means removing stigma and discrimination. So these worthy and deserving human beings get the support and professional help that they need in the same way as all the other chronic health conditions, which are also potentially life-threatening conditions like asthma, diabetes, breast cancer, bowel cancer, mm. prostate cancer, leukaemia, all forms of cancer. Those conditions are accepted and respected. They're uncomfortable because they lose their lives as a result of them. But anybody living with those other chronic health conditions Conditions that I've just mentioned get the full support and understanding of the broader global community. Yet, unfortunately, in 2018, there are there are millions of people grappling with it every day. Yet, they are having to live with stigma and discrimination on a daily basis. And we need to get educated quickly, accept the fact mental health conditions are legitimate medical conditions. People don't do this for attention. They don't choose it. Mental health conditions don't discriminate. You can be, you know, there's, there's a litany of examples in America of high-profile people, athletes, movie actors, business owners, incredibly rich people that have and are living with mental health conditions. Um, so money and material possessions has nothing to do with it. What we do sometimes, Mark, ignorantly, is we think that the vagrant who lives on the street, the man or woman, they're the ones with mental health conditions or, or people living who are, who are incarcerated. Mental health conditions can, can affect the homeless, the incarcerated, politicians, wealthy people beyond their own means. It can affect any person. 
person, irrespective of their background, their experience, their beliefs, their religions, their p- political position. It has nothing to do with that. It's just something that happens to people. And we need to accept and realise very quickly that we're losing valuable lives every day around the world that I believe is preventable. We can stop to create the right environments which are safe, supportive and non-judgmental. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure you'll agree with me, but I, I think that this is the most important thing that we should know. You know, I think that, um, you know, kids in the first grade um, should be learning about, um, you know, this kind of stuff and and the the optimal practices of doing things. And, um, you know, I I, like I personally believe that this is the most important thing in society that we should be focused on, because it's like if you don't have this within yourself, you really don't have anything at all like this is priority number one yeah look i i, I agree i mean i definitely agree with that mark i mean it's, it's interesting you, you can you i mean there's so much importance in it's just put on physical health uh, you know the shows here in australia are about um you know overweight people getting fit losing weight you can go on a 28 day detox you can juice you can go on a plant-based diet and i eat a predominantly plant-based um, there's so much much focus and attention uh, all around the world to physical health. That's only half of the equation. If we're genuine at our overall health, it's a combination of physical health and emotional health. And when we've got both of those um, components uh, in good positions, we're able to cope when inevitably life wants to throw a curveball at us. I, I have a philosophical view that we educate our kids um, with regards to subjects that are not relevant to their life. Institutionalised education today, where you know this is what we've taught, we've always taught it, so this is what kids need. We should be teaching kids life skills. I've got three kids myself, and they've been born into a world where technology area of their life, technology plays a really important role. But having worked in the telecommunication uh, industry for five years up until last year, we've never been more connected from a technology point of view. But from a human point of view, we've never been more disconnected. And when and they ask, what can I do? I'll make suggestions such as, have you tried meditation? Have you tried mindfulness? What about yoga? What about exercise? No, I haven't. Why haven't you? Because I don't have time. We live in a world now where we seem to have less time than we've ever had before. But what that really says to me is people are so busy being busy, which is not being productive, that they don't think they have the time to integrate something that can be really important. And that is disconnect technology and invest into your emotional health by doing some form of exercise, changing your diet, prioritizing your physical and emotional health. People are so busy because of the influence of technology that they don't think that they have time. That takes discipline and structure. But what's the priority? Is it being connected on a device or is it being connected as a human being and giving yourself the best opportunity to enjoy everything that life has and live as long as you possibly can? That's the question people need to ask themselves. Yeah, when that's uh, that's really interesting. And uh you know, two of the main philosophies for uh, this show, Humans 2.0, is uh, number one is uh, you control the technology, don't let the technology control you, and incorporate some kind of mindfulness activity at least once throughout your day. And, um, you know, for somebody that's, that's heavily, heavily integrated in the social media technology world, I work a lot with uh, virtual reality. For me, you know, I've kind of learned some key habits that I've found that really give me a, um, you know, a break, uh, so to speak, between, or not really between, but to really allow my mind to, you know, be grounded um, and not uh, be very fast paced, which is usually what happens, uh, you know, when you spend a lot of your time on, you know, just looking at a device. So I found that, you know, having meditation, having a, some forms of mindfulness, not using your phone, um, it, you know, in the morning when you wake up or, you know, 
at night when you're, you know, towards going to bed, I found that those have really benefited the, um, my situation. Yeah. And, and I would, I, I, I agree with that Mark. As last week I made a decision to, uh, remove, um, Facebook, Facebook pages, uh, and twin. I mean, the phone is all the time. Um, and what's interesting, and I'm, I'm a, um, heavy user of social media in relation to the mental health work that I do. Um, but we also have social media channel, uh, my business, Pucker Up, continues to do what it does. And we have a contest to manage that. So I'm not actively um, posting and sharing things on our platforms there. We have a partner who does that. But what I it was how often I was checking those social media ch- channels on my phone. And I've been to keep them off my phone. So I can a PC, I've got a laptop or an iPad that I can still check mm. those things. But I actually check them once or twice and until I remove those channels off, off my phone. And I was, I was on those platforms so often, not an effective use of my time, but more importantly, it was a learned habit. I was checking them because I felt I needed to check those channels. Now, is that mm. a productive use of my time? No. On a new startup business, good for my health emotionally? No, it's not. It's a decision that I've kept those channels off my phone, which allows me to focus on the more important course of the day. And then of a night time, I'll check the channels just as a consumer to see what's going on. And I'm limiting my time. And I feel better for that. I've got greater clarity. Um, I've come to accept the fact that it was not productive and more importantly, I don't give my mind to slow down and just recalibrate and that's really important. Hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds very awesome. So wait, I want to learn more or, or hear more about uh, Puka Up and um, how, did you, how did you start that and um, you know, what's it all about? Yeah, so the 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 genesis genesis for Pucker Up's creation was that twelve years ago I started a charity here in Australia, uh, which preventative education programs into secondary schools in Melbourne, and it was a successful program. We had involved in um, in the program, so we were able to identify ten percent of the student population who hadn't sought help for mental health them in with appropriate help-seeking pathways and providers. Um, but the problem that we ran into here in Australia four years after, after creating was that philanthropy money was quite restrictive. And what that meant mm. was um, one of our programs, um, we had research that validated the program, independent research. So the program was clearly working. More schools wanted the programs, but in order to deliver more programs, we had to increase our capacity. And unfortunately here in Australia, Funding requirements from philanthropy money meant that 80 or 90% of the funding that was given had to go to a program. So we couldn't increase our capacity. So we made a difficult decision to close the charity down. I continued to work in the mental health space, had a corporate role with a telecommunications company, and then um, 14 months ago, uh, who's been successful in business and need to catch up for a coffee and he asked me and the question was how much of an impact do you think you would have if you were full-time back in the mental health field and I said a lot more than what I currently am and this man and his company invested into Pucker Up brought it to life and we're 14 months into a very very early journey but um, the benefit we've already had in a very short period of time has been not only life-changing but uh, I received two messages over the weekend from people, um, and it's not about me, it's about a, that have thanked me because it saved their life. Um, you know, we've saved the lives of a lot of people, um, and I say that proudly because the work that we do is about having a positive impact on people's lives, but it's more important than that. It's actually saved the lives of people. And I can't think of anything more important outside of being the best husband I can and the best dad I can. Um, I can't think of anything more important and more rewarding than having a positive impact on other people's lives. And 
you know, it gives people hope. It gives them inspiration. It gives them, you know, a sense that there are people that care and there's all there. And for example, um, on the weekend, Mark, was that I got a message from and uh, his six closest male mates that they've been friends for 20 years have now started to have open and honest conversations about their own mental health because of the work that Pucker Up's doing. One of the things that Pucker Up focuses on is creating environments that allow people to have authentic and genuine conversations about mental health and emotional well-being. And that's important because if we can create as many of those conversations as possible, what it's actually doing, it's normalising mental health and emotional well-being. Normalise it. What the, 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 the net outcome of that is is when we normalise mental health and emotional well-being, we're preventing people from ending. And that's why these conversations are really important. Absolutely. And just like on a, on a side note, I've heard from, you know, a decent amount of people in this space that have told me a forming a, a, a nonprofit is not the most efficient way to, um, to, to spearhead a project like this that you want to see brought out and done to the world. Mm-hmm. I would, agree with, I, would agree, I would agree with that because with the, the lessons that we took away from closing our own not-for-profit down in 10, Pucker Up is not a, not a charity and we've been very deliberate and strategic with that. Um, I, put it, I, I put a proposal to them they endorsed, but we're a social enterprise. Hmm. We are a commercial looking to create a sustainable a new stream ourselves which means a few things well if i go back a step and this is this is with all due respect to we have more than six hundred thousand charities here in australia and we've got a population of about 25 million people and every one of those charities is created for the right reasons and good intentions okay. but with such a small population there's been an exponential growth in the number of charities here in australia the funding pool hasn't matched the growth of the number of charities. So what it really means is there's more charities competing for less money. So we don't believe it's a sustainable business model. So we've been very deliberate in creating a social enterprise. We are committed to looking to or committed to becoming a sustainable business ourselves, which means that in a respectful way, we're not relying on the generosity and goodwill of the Australian community. We're not relying on philanthropy money. We're not relying on the government. We're trying to build a business ourselves which allows us to reinvest our profits back into the areas that we want to invest into, which is suicide prevention. And if we can do that, we believe that if we can be successful, we give ourselves the greatest chance of being a long-term sustainable player in this space. And that's what we're focused on. Mm. Very well said. Yeah, and there's, no, and, there's, and there's no reason, there's no reason, there's no plausible reason the why you have to be a charity to address a social issue. There are charities being created every day, all day, and there are also charities closing their doors because they can't sustain the business. So why don't we think outside the square? Why don't we look at a social issue and go, we need to approach this from a business perspective, and if we make sound business decisions we can tackle a social issue and it, and for all the reasons that i've just explained you know i think that we need to think about these things because the government here in australia and i assume all over the world in america would be no different they're getting pulled in a million different places in a million different directions the reality is the government can't fund everything so if we sit around and wait for the government things won't get done so let's start to approach this from a business perspective make smart business decisions turn it into a sustainable business and then we can be a long-term player in this space and have an even greater impact. So, yeah, so Wayne, so I'm, you know, I'm really glad you, you, you know, you started this, this enterprise and, you know, you're, you're, you're definitely doing, um, you know, what's on you. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this, like the average person listening to this probably wants to help out in, uh, in some kind of way, you know, might be because they've, you know, 
been impacted by this. They might have a family member. Um, but for the average person that wants to contribute in in some way to helping this this cause out and maybe just mental health in general, what what, what could somebody start doing? Well, the, the, the thing that I would encourage um, people who may be listening to this podcast episode, Mark, um, to do one thing, join our online community. Um, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's probably the most obvious thing. But from my point of view, the most important thing, because we're trying to build a large online community, especially on Facebook. So if people are interested, pucker up, P-U-K-A-U-P. P-U-K-A-U-P. We're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Um, join, the, join the Facebook and, and Instagram community with Pucker Up. And, and why is that important? Because it's safe, it's supportive and it's non-judgmental. And we're prolific on social media. We're putting content up and conversations up every day. And it's a community that is global. Um, we really encourage people to join the community so you can be part of this movement that is beginning to normalise mental health and emotional well-being. And I'm also excited to share that um, Friday of last week, which would have been Thursday for you over there, my um, chairman and I sat down. Um, Pucker Up recently delivered an eight-day, 1,400-kilometre suicide prevention charity bike ride. Not a charity bike ride, but a bike ride. So we rode... Um, from Sydney to Melbourne. So they're the two largest metropolitan cities here in Australia. Um, and we, we're creating a documentary. So it's, it's a documentary around the value and benefit of authentic and genuine conversations. And that's really important, Mark. So we'll show this nationally, hopefully, later in the year. So if people want to be a part of the community and also see this documentary, um, they, they'll be able to see that on, on Facebook. And whether you live in America, you live in India, you live in Australia, this is a conversation that everyone can be and should be a part of. And effectively, we took, we took 38 people away from different backgrounds and different experiences and, and, and two-thirds of the group were strangers to each other. Within six days, we had them in a hotel room um, where every person cried openly and the majority of the group were men. Um, and it was about creating an environment that people felt safe, supported, and they weren't going to be judged. And we had the most amazing conversation with a group of people that six days earlier were strangers that felt so safe that they shared things that they'd only ever talked to their wife or their husband about. That's what's possible. When you, get, when you remove barriers and you create supportive environments it allows people to connect at a deeper level and they can have honest conversations. And we now have a group of 38 people that are out championing, championing the same conversations with friends, with family, with work colleagues, and it's changed their lives. And, and that's something that we want to be able to do all over the globe. And, you know, we're starting small. It's early days, but we're committed to the cause. That's fantastic, Wayne, and I'm sure you guys are going to do amazing things, and it's going to be real interesting to see, um, you know, where where this all plays out. So, Wayne, where can people go to uh, connect with you, learn more about what you're doing? Yep, so if uh, people would like to follow me, they can on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So, Wayne, W-A-Y-N-E, SWAS, S-C-H, W A S S C H W A S. I've got um, uh, channels on those uh, particular platforms, and the same for Pucker Up P U K A U P on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you know, our doors are open twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Um, doesn't matter where people are located around the globe. If they'd like to be part of this movement, we welcome them with open arms. And the more people, the more voices uh, we have as part of this movement, the greater impact we can have. And it's really everybody's community. I don't own it. It's not mine. It's just something that we've created and we want to encourage everybody to join. Amazing. Wayne, final thing. I'd like to ask my guests to leave the audience with a self-inquisitive question because I think questions that you ask yourself can be really powerful tools for transformation. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd ask this question. I ask it all the time. If you're investing time, money and effort into your physical health because it's important, 
Are you investing the same amount of time, money and effort into your emotional health? And if not, why not? What's preventing you from doing it? That's amazing. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Wayne, so much for coming on. This has been your host, Mark Mattery. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback, whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.